So something most people don't realize is our cells can biosynthesize fat and can biosynthesize these free fatty acids. Essentially what our cells do is they take carbohydrates and amino acids and oxidate them to form acetyl-CoA. Now once we form acetyl-CoA, we can use these two carbons in acetyl-CoA to biosynthesize free fatty acids. Now once we biosynthesize these free fatty acids, we can go through the process of lipogenesis to biosynthesize triglycerides, which is the primary storage form of energy our body uses. So to do this process of fatty acid synthesis, where we biosynthesize these free fatty acids, we need NADPH, this reduced cofactor, because NADPH has electrons that it can donate towards this process of fatty acid synthesis. Because if we wanna biosynthesize this free fatty acid, we need electrons for these bonds. So we get those electrons from NADPH. Also in order to go through the process of fatty acid synthesis, we need to activate this acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme, which is the rate limiting enzyme and the rate limiting step for fatty acid synthesis. So the key idea is if you have low activation of this enzyme, then you do very little fatty acid synthesis. However, if you strongly activate this enzyme, then you do a lot of fatty acid synthesis. So we regulate this pathway of fatty acid synthesis by regulating this enzyme. So something important to realize is eating a lot of carbohydrates is a great way to tell your cells to biosynthesize a lot of fat and a lot of fatty acids. Because if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, we know we oxidize those excess carbohydrates to form acetyl-CoA. And remember, these carbons in acetyl-CoA are the carbons we use to biosynthesize these free fatty acids. Also, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, that will activate the pentose phosphate pathway, which is the way we produce this NADPH, which is again the source of electrons used to biosynthesize these free fatty acids. So again, these electrons that are used to biosynthesize these free fatty acids, these electrons come from carbohydrates and glucose. Also, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, that tells your pancreas to release a lot of insulin and insulin activates this acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme. So therefore, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you increase insulin, which activates this enzyme, which then allows your cells to do a lot of fatty acid synthesis. And also insulin activates lipogenesis, which then takes those fatty acids to biosynthesize triglycerides. So therefore, we can see why excess carbohydrates is a great way to help your cells biosynthesize a lot of excess fat. So how exactly do we take the carbons and glucose to biosynthesize these free fatty acids? Well, if you eat excess glucose, it enters the pathway of glycolysis. And as glucose molecules enter the pathway of glycolysis, we produce a lot of these intermediates in glycolysis. And something important to realize is this particular intermediate of glycolysis then enters the pentose phosphate pathway. And as we go through the pentose phosphate pathway, we produce these NADPH reduced cofactors, which are the source of electrons that are used to biosynthesize these free fatty acids. And we'll learn about that later. Also, as we go through glycolysis, we produce pyruvate. And then pyruvate goes from the cytoplasm and enters inside of the mitochondria. Then once pyruvate enters inside the mitochondria, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA goes through the Krebs cycle. However, we know it's these two carbons in acetyl-CoA that are used to biosynthesize free fatty acids. However, these free fatty acids are biosynthesized in the cytoplasm. So how do we take these carbons in acetyl-CoA to biosynthesize these free fatty acids? Well, if you follow these two carbons in acetyl-CoA, we know acetyl-CoA reacts with oxaloacetate to form citrate. And again, these are the carbons that came from acetyl-CoA. Then citrate leaves the mitochondria and enters the cytoplasm. Then once citrate enters the cytoplasm, this, these two carbons pop off in the form of acetyl-CoA. And now that these two carbons of acetyl-CoA have entered the cytoplasm, now we can biosynthesize these free fatty acids with the help of these electrons from NADPH. Also realize different amino acids can enter at different steps to use their carbons to biosynthesize acetyl-CoA and therefore biosynthesize free fatty acids. For example, certain amino acids can enter at this particular step, which then can use their carbons to get converted to acetyl-CoA, then to citrate, then back to acetyl-CoA to biosynthesize free fatty acids. 
So in principle, anything that can be converted to acetyl-CoA can use their carbons to biosynthesize free fatty acids. And once you form acetyl-CoA, then you enter this pathway of fatty acid synthesis. So now we know we can take these two carbons in acetyl-CoA and use these carbons to biosynthesize these free fatty acids. However, how exactly do we biosynthesize these free fatty acids? Well, the first step is to take this particular carbon and react it with this carbon and bicarbonate. So the way we do this is we deprotonate this hydrogen. And when we do that, we're left with this carbon anion, which we know is very nucleophilic. Also, it's important to realize that this carbon and bicarbonate is very electrophilic. So we can have this nucleophilic carbon react with this electrophilic carbon. So we nucleophilically attack forming a bond, we form a bond, and when we form a bond, we push these pi electrons up onto this oxygen. And when we do that, we're left with a tetrahedral intermediate, which looks like this. So again, we attack forming a bond, and then we push those pi electrons up, forming this tetrahedral intermediate. Now what happens is these electrons scooch down, forming a double bond, and once we form a double bond, this bond breaks, and these electrons fall on this oxygen. And when we do that, we're left with this product. So again, the electrons scooch down, forming a double bond. We see that here. And when this double bond is formed, this bond breaks and these electrons fall on this oxygen. So this acts as a leaving group and we see that here. So now we form this compound. So the key idea is we take this acetyl-CoA, we react it with this bicarbonate to form this compound, which is referred to as malonyl-CoA. And I showed you the, the mechanism where we attack forming the tetrahedral intermediate, then the electrons scooch back down, breaking this bond, and these electrons fall on this oxygen. But for the rest of this video, let's simplify this mechanism where, again, we form a bond, and we break a bond where these electrons fall on this oxygen, and then we form this product. So this is a very common mechanism, but to simplify it, let's just say we form a bond and we break a bond where these electrons fall on this guy, and then we're left with this product, malonyl-CoA. Now, once we form malonyl-CoA, we can take these two carbons, which again, remember, came from acetyl-CoA, we can take these two carbons and use them to biosynthesize the free fatty acid. So how do we do that? Well, we have this enzyme referred to as fatty acid synthase, which is in the process of biosynthesizing a free fatty acid. So let's say it's early on in the process, so it's biosynthesizing a free fatty acid, and right now we only have a four carbon fatty acid. So this fatty acid synthase enzyme is in the process of building a longer fatty acid, because right now we have four carbon. So remember that, right now we have a four carbon fatty acid, but we want to build a longer fatty acid. But in order to do this, we need carbons. We need to add more carbons. So where do we get those carbons? Well, we get those carbons from malonyl-CoA. And remember, these carbons came from acetyl-CoA. So therefore, this fatty acid synthase enzyme wants to incorporate these two carbons into this fatty acid to biosynthesize a longer fatty acid. So how do we do this? Well, the first step is to deprotonate this thiol sulfur group. So when we deprotonate this hydrogen, we're left with this sulfur anion, which is very nucleophilic. So now it realized that this particular carbon in malonyl-CoA is electrophilic. So this sulfur nucleophile can nucleophilically attack this carbon electrophile. And when we do that, we go through a very similar mechanism to like we saw before, where this carbon nucleophilically attacked this carbon, we go through a very similar mechanism where this sulfur nucleophilically attacks this carbon. When we do that, we push these pi electrons up on the oxygen, forming a tetrahedral intermediate. Then the electrons fall back down, reforming a double bond. Then this bond breaks, and these electrons fall on this sulfur. So it's a very similar mechanism. So again, to simplify, we nucleophilically attack forming a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond where these electrons fall on the sulfur. And when we do that, we form this product. Where again, we nucleophilically attack forming a bond, so that's represented by this bond between the sulfur and carbon, between the sulfur and carbon. So we nucleophilically attack forming a bond represented by this bond, and then this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the sulfur. So when this bond breaks, this CoA group just diffuses away. And when we do that, we're left with this product. So once we form this product, the next step is to go through a decarboxylation reaction where this carboxyl group pops off. 
So the way we do this is these lone pairs of electrons scooch down, forming a double bond. And when we do that, this bond breaks and these electrons fall on this carbon. And when we do that, we're left with this product. So again, we go through a decarboxylation reaction. The carboxyl group pops off as a carbon dioxide molecule, which diffuses away. And we're left with this carbon anion. But notice, this carbon is an anion, so it's very nucleophilic. And also realize this carbonyl carbon is very electrophilic. So therefore, we have a nucleophile and electrophile in close proximity, so they're going to react. This carbon nucleophile is going to nucleophilically attack this carbon electrophile. So when we nucleophilically attack, we form a bond representing this bond. So when we nucleophilically attack, we form a bond. And when we form that bond, then we break a bond, and these electrons fall on the sulfur. So when we do that, we form this product. Again, the red nucleophilically attacks the purple, so that would represent this bond. And once we do that, this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the sulfur, and we're left with the sulfur anion. So now we're left with this product. But notice what we've done. Now we have the six carbon long compound. So remember, we started off with this small four carbon long fatty acid, but we've essentially elongated it, and now we have the six carbon compound. So we've elongated the fatty acid. So now we have this product, but notice this doesn't quite resemble a fatty acid. This resembles a fatty acid, but we have the second carbonyl group. So we need to get rid of this carbonyl group. We need to reduce it. So how do we do that? Well, the next step is for this NADPH to come along. Remember, through the pentose phosphate pathway, we produce this NADPH, which we explain has electrons that it donates to reduce this compound. So essentially the way this happens is to realize this NADPH has this hydrogen with electrons, which really acts like a hydride, which essentially can nucleophilically attack this carbon. So when we do that, we form a bond, and when we form a bond, we push these pi electrons up on the oxygen, forming a tetrahedral intermediate. So when we do that, we form this tetrahedral intermediate, and then this oxygen anion gets protonated, and now we form a hydroxyl group. So now we have this hydroxyl group, but we're not done yet. So the next step is essentially for a base to come along and deprotonate this hydrogen. And once we deprotonate this hydrogen, these electrons scooch down, forming a double bond. And when that happens, this bond breaks and these electrons fall on this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this product. So we just go through a simple elimination reaction. And while we go through this elimination reaction, simultaneously, this leaving group will get protonated. So really, we're forming a water molecule. And now this water molecule diffuses away. And now we're left with this product. So we're almost there. Realize this almost resembles a fatty acid. So the last step is to reduce this double bond. So now another NADPH comes along and again donates electrons and hydrogens to reduce this double bond. And when we do that, we reduce the double bond and we're left with this structure. So now this does resemble a fatty acid. Now we've essentially elongated the fatty acid. Now we have the six carbon long process. So we've done it. We were in the process of building a longer fatty acid. So now we have six carbons. So again, the point is, as long as you eat excess carbohydrates and proteins and amino acids, our cells can oxidize these biomolecules into acetyl-CoA. And now once we form acetyl-CoA, we can use these two carbons in acetyl-CoA and incorporate these carbons into a fatty acid to build free fatty acids. And again, we know the way we do that. We take the acetyl-CoA and react it with bicarbonate to form malonyl-CoA. Now when we form malonyl-CoA, again, we can incorporate these two carbons into this fatty acid to build a longer fatty acid through this process of fatty acid synthesis. So again, to go through the cycle one more time, we create the sulfur nucleophile, which again, nucleophilically attacks this carbon electrophile. When we do that, we form a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond and these electrons fall in the sulfur. When we do that, we're left with this product. Now that we form this product, we go through a decarboxylation reaction where these electrons scooch down, forming a double bond. And when that happens, this bond breaks and these electrons fall on this carbon. When we do that, we're left with this product. And now realize we have a carbon nucleophile in close proximity to a carbon electrophile. So they're going to react. We're going to nucleophilically attack, forming a bond. When we form a bond, this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the sulfur.
When we do that, we're left with this product and we've done it. Now we've done it. We've essentially elongated the fatty acids. So now we have this eight carbon long compound, but we know now we need to reduce this carbonyl and we know how we do that. We use the electrons in NADPH, which donates electrons and hydrogens to reduce this carbonyl into a hydroxyl group. Now, when we form this hydroxyl group, now a base comes along and deprotonates this hydrogen, allowing these electrons to scooch down, forming a double bond. And when that happens, this bond breaks, these electrons fall on this guy, and we essentially go through a simple elimination reaction. And when we do that, we're left with this product. And again, this leaving group just floats away. So now we're almost there. The last step is to reduce this double bond. And again, we do that from the electrons from NADPH. So again, NADPH donates electrons, reducing this double bond, saturating it, and we're left with this compound, which again, now resembles a fatty acid. So now we built this eight carbon long fatty acid. So we've done it. And now we can continue to add carbons from acetyl-CoA, incorporate it into this fatty acid to build a longer and longer fatty acid. So again, as long as you have the carbohydrates and amino acids to get oxidized to form these carbons in acetyl-CoA, you can essentially use these carbons to biosynthesize a longer fatty acid. So our cells are gonna continuously do this until we form a 16 carbon long fatty acid. And this is the fatty acid that our cells produce. So we're gonna continuously add acetyl-CoA molecules until we build the 16 carbon long compound. Now what we need to do is we essentially need to hydrolyze this bond. We need to break this bond, releasing this fatty acid. So we do that with the help of water and an enzyme, which essentially allows the water to nucleophilically attack forming a bond. When we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall in the sulfur and we're left with this compound. And so now we've done it. We've officially biosynthesized a fatty acid. We've gone through this process of fatty acid synthesis. So we build the 16 carbon long palmitic acid. This is the fatty acid that our cells can biosynthesize. So again, the key point is that our cells can biosynthesize fatty acids. That, that may not be very intuitive, but if you eat excess carbohydrates and amino acids, our cells can take those excess biomolecules to biosynthesize fat, this palmitic acid. And once we form this palmitic acid, then we can go through the process of lipogenesis to biosynthesize these triglycerides, which is the primary storage form of energy our cells use, our body use. So if you eat a big diet and a lot of carbohydrates and proteins, we can essentially store the energy in those molecules in the form of triacylglyceride, these triglycerides. So again, this is the process of fatty acid synthesis.